Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. We've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. A stinker of a plan to get up Nazi noses. The true life unsolved horror of the hikers on the mountain of death. 634 ways to bring down Fidel Castro. A new kind of war. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons ever mooted in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is that it seems to work. Mysterious events. This is brilliant. You couldn't make this up. Unexplained phenomena. This is all crazy. I kind of don't even know where to begin with this. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. World War II. A dangerous new weapon is about to be deployed. It looks like a cowpat. It stinks of rancid eggs and vomit. And it could change the course of the war. This is the true tale of how the Allies used poo to pick on the Nazis. This is the cast of Stand By Me sitting there coming up with novel ways to win the war. World War II is being fought on land, sea, and in the air. Conventional weapons, by and large, do the job. But actually, both sides are looking for more inventive forms of weaponry in order to outwit their opponents. Any kind of development, no matter how ridiculous it sounds when you first pitch it, you are looking for something that will give you an advantage. Yeah, you can just drop bombs from aeroplanes. But what if you can do something far more subtle? What if you can, you know, get a weapon to the enemy, leave it there, and he doesn't notice it for a while? This reality led all of the combatant powers of the conflict to look for alternative ways of gaining an upper hand on the opposition. They looked at everything. They even considered some ideas that stink. Winston Churchill is a big enthusiast of new technologies. Churchill had many faults, but also in some ways he was quite visionary. He realised that you couldn't just fight this new war with conventional means. You had to do underhand, dirty tactics in order to get the better of the Germans. So, at the outset, in 1940, he establishes the Special Operations Executive, the SOE. Nicknamed Churchill's Secret Army, it is the forerunner to MI6. The purpose of SOE was famously, quote, to set Europe ablaze. And that's just what it tried to do. An irregular force that carries out covert activities, engaged in demolitions, assassinations. Acts of sabotage, and particularly to work with various resistance organizations across Europe, so clandestine operations. From the beginning, it's, it's seen as a bit of a bizarre organization. Some of the stuff that they come up with sounds like something out of a James Bond film. Some people, quite understandably, look at kind of what the boffins are up to in SOE, developing all these apparently quite silly-looking weapons, and thinking, look, we're trying to fight a war here, let's be sensible. But actually, no, what you need to do in order to actually have a highly effective underground guerrilla army, you need new types of weaponry. And in the end, the SOE becomes something that, through sabotage operations, meaningfully undermines Nazi Germany's ability to wage war. The SOE starts small, but it's thinking big. You've got to remember that SOE has got to start somewhere. Every bomb that's placed in a railway yard, every German who's assassinated, all these are going to help the war effort in a little way. So that's why you've got to develop these types of weapons. They start off by targeting automobiles. The reason for that is that it takes quite a lot. 
to destroy a tank, automobiles are much more vulnerable to an attack. And what's also useful about blowing up a car is that it blocks a road once you've done it, so you get a bit more disruption there. But also, a blown up car is a very visible thing. People passing will go, why was that blown up? Something must be going on. But why waste large amounts of explosives blowing up a car if disabling it works just as well? One of the first things that they come up with is a tire burster that will cause the blowout of an automobile wheel. This device is about two inches in diameter and it's got a little bit of plastic explosive and a pressure detonator that obviously will set it off if someone drives over it. It's effectively just a tiny landmine. But what's difficult about it is that it's very hard to disguise. You, know, you can see it on the road and the driver might spot it. So they come up with the idea of camouflaging the tire burster. Now, fortunately, many of the people working at SOE in this department had worked for film and theatre productions. They were pretty good at making things camouflaged. They were good at designing things and making things look like what they weren't. Now, what's the best way of camouflaging something that's got to sit on a road and no one's going to think, hmm, what's that? It's animal poo. It's just a tiny pile of poo right in the middle of the road. There's nothing suspicious about that. So they then go about devising fake crap that will sit innocently in the middle of the road, looking like a turd, until a German drives over it and destroys his car. But the fake poo must be carefully crafted to appear authentic. Of course, if you're going to make some fake poo, you've got to have the right local type of poo. They need mule dung from Italy. You want camel crap for North Africa. Northern France, you're going to need horse droppings. You can't just get a lump of plasticine and make a crap and make it look convincing. So what do the boffins do? They go to London Zoo and they say, please, can we have some of your poo? And London Zoo go, yeah, here we go. Here are lots of different types of poo. And the boffins take the poo and they copy it and they mould it into plastic and they even hand paint the poo to make it look really authentic. It's brilliant. And in the end, the poo-covered tire bomb is a banging success. This isn't the only way that the SOE plays with its poo. Because of all these below-the-belt operations, the SOE are soon given uh, quite an appropriate nickname. It's known as the Ministry for Ungentlemanly Warfare. And actually, they come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful ungentlemanly ideas. They become quite inventive in their methods of physical and psychological attack. When you have a genius idea like utilising crap to win the war, you want to try and implement it in as many ways as possible. One of the ideas is to target the German officers, who are famously you know, quite smart chaps, with neatly combed hair, with pristine uniforms, and take a lot of pride in their appearance. They're also known to have uh, a fondness for French perfume, which gives the SOE a stinker of an idea. If someone's got raging BO or he stinks of crap, you're not going to respect him. They formulate a brand new weapon, stench liquid. The so-called S liquid is actually one of their greatest achievements and probably the smelliest job in the whole of the Second World War. S-liquid can be delivered in a couple of ways. It can be hidden in the atomizer of perfume. It can be impregnated into a gelatin grenade. They can be thrown and then they break on someone's clothes and all the smelly substance goes all over them. Seriously horrible. They're going to make the world's most disgusting stink bomb. But S-liquid is no joke. At its heart lies a whiff of hard science. British intelligence actually produced a document, and I'm not kidding, called Facts About Feces. It analyzed the alkaline-rich odors that were produced by diets that were heavy in meat and compares them against stools that were produced by diets that were heavy in milk. And of course, having literally dug deep into their subject matter, the SOE scientists soon identified a compound which they called scatol, which produces the absolutely disgusting aroma of feces. And once they'd identified that, they were able to use it with devastating effect. Having smelt it, they then dealt it with a vengeance. 
in August 1943, the SOE decides to spread it all around. SOE are very happy to uh, share their smelly secrets with the Americans, and they give it to the OSS, which is the forerunner to the CIA. A research and development specialist named Stanley Lovell is told about S-liquid, and he begins to develop a unique American blend of it. He commissions a man called Crocker to go out and make the smelliest bomb he can. Do your worst, and we'll win the war. Crocker rises to the challenge like the reek of a landfill on a summer afternoon. So Crocker and a fellow chemist, a man called Lloyd Henderson, start working uh, with some of the smelliest things around. Apparently the guys developing it smelt so bad midway into their research that they had to start sleeping in the park because they just offended anybody they went near. They sniff out over 525 materials, everything from sandalwood to rancid fat and then eventually assign each one a code that reflects its intensity. And then from that, they try and pick out the very worst of them and combine them. I feel sick just thinking about it. <laughs> the nastiest odor known to man is soon ready for launch. The Americans come up with a really uh, innocuous sounding name for this substance called Who Me? Because you know why? It smells as bad as a really, really noxious fart. In fact, worse. It is a blend of rancid butter, foot odor, urine, vomit, and excrement. These are a few of my favorite things. How much money went into this? This has to have been thought up by a 12-year-old boy. There's no way on God's earth a fully grown man sits there and thinks, I know how I can affect serious disciplinary issues in the German army by a giant stink bomb. This has got 12-year-old boy written all over it. This is the cast of Stand By Me sitting there coming up with novel ways to win the war. One thing they didn't think of was how to package the smell. It's very difficult to come up with a delivery method for this volatile combo because very often the container ends up degrading and the person who's delivering the smell ends up just as stinky as the target does. What they created was so disgusting and so rancid that it would just rot through any container that they put it in. After a brief trial and error period, Crocker decides to use tubes that are sealed at the end with a rubber cap. In late 1944, the OSS develops a new formulation dedicated for the Japanese market with just the tiniest whiff of racial stereotyping for good measure. The OSS assumes that the Japanese won't respond the same to these smells that Europeans would. They make the assumption that their sewage system is rudimentary, and so that the smell of excrement, for example, won't be particularly offensive to them. So they don't think that making something that smells of feces is really going to work. Instead, they decide they're going to make it smell of rotting flesh. They think that's really going to turn up those Japanese noses. Because they think they have to go above and beyond with the stink to offend a Japanese person. Excellent. 600 units of Who Me are manufactured for deployment, but they are never used. Just weeks before it's about to be handed to the Chinese resistance, the atomic bombs fall on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That, of course, means the end of the war and ending the chances for this smelly superweapon ever being used in combat. But the legacy of Who Me still kind of lingers. The nearest we get to stink bombs these days of course, the type of things that you might buy in a joke shop. But actually, you know, those toys that, you know, we laugh about uh, and kids play with actually have their roots in the work carried out by SOE. Marilyn Monroe made Chanel famous, but who knows, we could have had a future where Crocker number five made a big stink. I'll stick to using my cologne. Coming up. A group of happy hikers disappears in the Ural Mountains. The group is about to become part of one of the weirdest unsolved mysteries in Soviet history. When their camp is discovered, it's been abandoned in a hurry. What made these young people get out of their tents when they're almost completely naked? What happened? What were they scared of? What were they running from? 
What real life horror story did these poor souls become part of? If there's one place you don't want to end up, I'm guessing it's the place that translates as Mountain of the Dead. When the war goes cold, things get even weirder. Imagine the scene at the start of a horror movie. A group of bright young things off on a happy hike into the mountains. Eight men and two women. They're all known to each other. It's quite a merry band of young people going off on an adventure. Probably a little bit too much adventure for their liking. The group is about to become part of one of the weirdest unsolved mysteries in Soviet history. Because in a week, they're all going to be dead. Nineteen fifty nine. A group of mountain hikers sets out on a one hundred and ninety mile trek across the northern Urals. During January and February, this trail is considered a seriously challenging route. As well it might, it's the northern Urals and it's winter. Now, if they complete it, they're gonna be given a category three certificate, which is you know really impressive. Their leader is Ignor Dyatlov. He's 23 and he's an engineering student. The group consists of 10 students and graduate students from the Ural Polytechnic Institute. It's not long before one of them is forced to drop out. After just one day, one of the group turns back. He's 21, he's called Yuri Yudin, and he's suffering from really bad knee and joint pain. But that doesn't deter the remaining nine. So photographs taken by them show happy people going off on a grand adventure. Um, they all seem pretty tight with each other. Uh, yeah, it's just a bit of fun, really. Challenging fun, but nonetheless, like, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to be involved in. It's clear when you look at these pictures that this isn't just a happy group, they're also a well-prepared group. They're wearing the right kit, so they're prepared for any eventuality. On January the 31st, 1959, um, the group come to the edge of Highlands and they set up a camp and they're setting up for climbing. The following day, they start to make their way through the steep pass. But the weather's against them. It's snowing, it's blustery. Can't see where they're going, really tough conditions, and they end up veering off their path. Accidentally climbing a mountain called Kolatsiaki. If there's one place you don't want to end up, I'm guessing it's the place that translates as Mountain of the Dead. The hikers are never heard from again. So a week goes by and they haven't reappeared. So the Ural University organizes a sort of rescue crew of students and volunteers to go out and find them. And eventually they are joined by the police and military in this effort. On the 26th of February, the team finally arrives at Kolatsiaki. And there they find the camp put there by Dyatlov. And it's a real shock. Everything inside is still as you would think it should be. They're cooking stoves, sleeping bags, you know, all the detritus of a camp is there. But what's missing are the people. This is like the Mary Celeste. The big hint that something's gone wrong is that there are huge slash marks in the tent. But not from the outside, but from the inside. So what are the group trying to escape from? The rescue team follow the footprints that lead away from the camp. These footprints are not the footprints of someone wearing boots. It looks like people wearing socks or barefoot. Clearly, if you're going out into the snow just wearing socks, you're obviously terrified of something. Or you are fleeing something. They follow the footprints down to this kind of wooded area, and of course it's there that they find a seriously grisly discovery. They find the first two bodies of the campers, but they're only in their underpants and socks. There's no obvious sign of injury, like they were being attacked by anything. Um, just to look at them, um, it just looks like they've succumbed to hypothermia. Three more corpses are found nearby, but they're also in a state of partial undress. But it looks like they were trying to get back to the main campsite. Of course, the massive, horrific mystery is this. What made these young people get out of their tents when it almost completely naked. You don't go out into the snow just wearing your underpants and your socks. What happened to them? What were they scared of? What were they running from? It takes another two months before the remaining four members of the group are found in a ravine 75 meters further into the forest. 
They had extra clothes, so it looked like they'd taken some clothes from one of the other people who died of hypothermia in their underclothes. According to the autopsy reports on several of the individuals, the injury patterns are consistent with heavy impact crush injuries, similar to a car accident. One has a smashed in skull, the other has chest fractures, so impact injuries. The state of three of these four bodies is not pretty. But what's more horrific is that one of them, the woman Dubinina is her name, there is nothing left of her tongue, parts of her face and her eyes. They've gone. And what they also see are lacerations to her hands. And the weirdness doesn't end there. Further examination reveals something else. Specifically, the hikers' bodies um, have a radioactive substance on them and they're kind of an orangey-yellow colour as well, so something's clearly not right. The official autopsy report concludes that they died of a compelling natural force. Now, that's just bureaucratic speak for we don't know what happened. So you have to ask yourself, what really happened? For lack of any official explanation, people start coming up with all kinds of bizarre theories. One theory that's been put forward is paradoxical undressing, which is that when you're suffering from hypothermia and you get really, really cold, you actually start to believe you're overheating and you start ripping your clothes off. It's not unreasonable. But actually, you know, what about the strange coloured skin? What about these weird external wounds? That isn't answered by hypothermia. A more compelling theory is that possibly they were fleeing an avalanche. They heard the sound of approaching snow, they fled thinking it would be better to get away from the onrush and they could come back and collect supplies later. But if that were true, then there'd be more damage to the campsite and also no reports of avalanches. So that theory doesn't hold water anyway. Personally, I like the Yeti theory. They mentioned sort of like an abominable snowman style person in the expedition log. The rumours of um, a Yeti-like being, basically, living in the Urals near Ototon. And then in one photograph um, found on one of the cameras in the group, there is a humanoid being in the background, which uh, possibly resembles the description that the local Manti tribe give of a six foot nine humanoid yeti thing that roams the local area. This isn't a yeti. It looks like some guy walking off into the distance and the photographer forgot to focus the lens. A yeti would be big and tall and have very distinct deep footprints in the snow. None were found. Also, no non-human primate can metabolically survive in this area ever at all. Just, it's not possible. The woman that they found, Dubnina, missing her tongue, rather than being like a yeti eating her face, it could be scavenging later on, after some time after they died. An animal would have eaten the soft parts of her face. That, unfortunately, is pretty common. But that wouldn't explain the radioactive material or the discoloration of the bodies. The radioactive um, substances on their bodies, you could explain by the fact that they, they may well have used them in experiments at college. Um, and also as well, the discoloration on the bodies you can explain away possibly by rapid mummification in cold conditions and high winds. Yet that doesn't explain the violence of their deaths. The investigators are stumped until they discover that there was another group of hikers in the area. Now this group claims that they saw these very strange orange spheres in the sky uh, that night at around the same time that the Dyatlov group was heading towards the pass. But while they all agree that orange orbs are sighted, there is a huge disagreement as to what they signify. UFO conspiracy theorists think that they were actually attacked by some sort of UFO alien orb and that explains a discoloration on their skin. These orange orbs are obviously very mysterious. Um, you can come up with any theory you want. I think it seems more likely that the entire episode was a Cold War military accident. And there is a military weapon that creates orange lights in the sky. In the late 1950s, in that remote mountain area in the northern Urals, it's known that the Soviets were testing a thing called a parachute mine. That is simply a, like a landmine attached to a parachute and it explodes before it hits the ground. The concussion could cause massive internal injuries without marking the outside, which is, is what they had. It's possible that the concussion of the mine knocks a tin over. They 
can't get out, so they cut their way out the back, and they flee into the night in terror. You're not worried about getting cold, you're worried about being exploded. Uh, you'll then run sensibly into some trees uh, for cover, but that might not help you either. Um, and what's gonna happen is you're gonna be blown up by this, this basically this barrage of mines. But for any veteran of modern warfare, these injuries don't seem consistent with concussion mines. There should be a lot of other secondary injuries to this sort of thing, because this sort of thing I saw in Iraq almost on a daily basis by people who went through IEDs. Every one of them would have overpressure injuries that would be visible in their eardrums, their eyeballs, and their capillary beds. And if I had a patient who had been through an IED, was suffering, and didn't have all these secondary ones, I would wonder what the hell's going on. The only thing I can speculate is maybe there was some military testing, and the Russian military covered it up. And it's not just the inconsistent injuries that suggest a cover-up. The case is filled with irregularities. It looked like the tents had been knocked down and then put back up because an experienced group of um, mountaineers wouldn't have put their tents up like that. There are also um, question marks over the positioning of the first three bodies. They look as if they're clawing their way back to camp, but the way they've been positioned isn't quite convincing and possibly it was staged and they were moved from elsewhere. The sole survivor of the hiking trip, Yuri Yudin, also believes there was a cover-up. Yuri Yudin was saved by the fact that he had these knee and joint uh, problems, and he ends up becoming quite a, a senior administrator in that region. And when he is asked by the Soviet military to go and look at the site, he finds all the detritus of the campsite. And it seems to him, uh, judging by what he sees, that this is a terrible military accident. And, and these poor people have just stumbled into it at the wrong time. Whether these poor students were killed by a Cold War conspiracy or something even stranger remains a mystery to this day. Every logical route of inquiry comes to a dead end. There's some pretty awesome possibilities, aliens, yetis, um, or a Soviet military cover-up. Either way, it's a really bizarre Cold War story. Coming up... Fidel Castro is U.S. enemy number one. There were more attempts to kill Fidel Castro than any other man who ever lived. It's said they tried to take him out 634 times. No matter how hard they try, they find it impossible to snuff him out. From cigar bombs to exploding seashells, their attempts are like a kiddies cartoon. Did no one ever just think, let's just go and drop a bomb on the presidential palace? I'm a rank amateur when it comes to killing people, and I'm pretty sure given five minutes I could come up with something that's better than this. Twenty sixth of July, nineteen fifty nine, Fidel Castro leads a popular coup against the corrupt regime of President Batista. He's a hero to his people, El Comandante. This man is the leader of their revolution. To the Americans, he's communist scum. Um, and not only that, but he's communist scum on their doorstep, and they quite badly want him dead. No matter how hard they try, they find it impossible to snuff him out. Because El Comandante has a lot more than nine lives. So what's it gonna take to kill Fidel? When Fidel Castro comes to power in 1959, ordinary Cubans are ecstatic. Castro is immensely popular in Cuba. He's seen as someone who's toppled a corrupt regime, um, and he's starting to restore wealth back to the people. He's ending US dominance of this island once and for all. He's taken US-owned businesses and seized the, the money back for Cuban people. It's revolutionary, and they love him for it. Unsurprisingly, the United States doesn't. Worried observers in the USA are witnessing a communist takeover right on America's doorstep. Americans believed that Cuba belonged to the United States. But instead, there was Cuba as a Marxist outpost in North America under the leadership of Fidel Castro. There's an implicit threat about a communist island being established, you know, not that far from the coast of the southern United States. So Castro is someone that they really want to get rid of, and they're going to try just about every method under the sun to do it. 
The CIA allegedly tried to discredit or kill Fidel a total of 634 times. He pushes past police and security guards to return the enthusiastic greetings, despite rumors of assassination plots against him. You can kind of break these down by president. And you've got, during the Eisenhower administration, an alleged 38 attempts. Bearing in mind Kennedy was assassinated himself, his administration apparently tried 42 times. Then you got Johnson, 72. Nixon, um, obviously not a great example of a world leader himself. His administration tried nearly 200 times and failed every single time. Carter, a relatively small 64. Ronald Reagan, now this is a big one, 197 attempts. Then you got George Bush Senior, he comes in at a relatively low 16 attempts. And then finally, you've got Bill Clinton's administration during which 21 attempts are made. So you've got there, if my maths is right, 634 attempts bringing Castro down. Some of these alleged attempts are truly bizarre. One idea was to make his beard fall out, and with no beard, he would look weak and fallible. It's part of his brand. It, it's his symbol, if you like. So the Americans realizing this think, actually, wouldn't it be great? We can't kill him. Let's just make his beard fall out. Then they think, well, how are we going to do that? Well, there's a nasty little substance called thallium salt, which is a hair remover. Uh, and if you can get that somewhere near Castro, you can make his beard fall out, and indeed, all his hair. The plan was to have American agents steal into Fidel's uh, private residence in the former Hilton Hotel in Havana, and then to place thallium salt in his boots. And then his feet would absorb the chemicals, his beard and presumably all his other body hair would fall out <laughs> for what? A week till it started growing again? You actually would have to kill the hair follicle for it to work. Presumably, he won't just wake up without a beard and everyone will go, oh, and stop following him. They'll just think he's had a shave. And then a week later, the beginnings of the beard would be back again and everyone would be like, oh, we respect him again now. I don't think anyone seriously thought this through, did they? No one thought about the likelihood of the pesky beard coming back again. In another effort to discredit Castro, a TV station where he was to give a live broadcast would be sprayed with LSD. The idea about giving him LSD is that if he's suddenly having a trip and freaking out before he goes on air, he's going to be talking gibberish, he's going to make him look like an idiot and totally undermine him in the eyes of the Cuban people. Sadly, the plan didn't take into account the fact that Castro was infamous for long and rambling speeches. He holds the record for the longest speech to the UN, at four hours and 29 minutes, and the longest speech he ever recorded was over seven hours long. Everyone expects Fidel to talk rubbish for hours. It's what he does. Someone with a brain comes along at that point um, in the Eisenhower administration and decides to um, form an army of angry Cubans. The CIA assumed that these revenge-hungry Cubans would get the job done without looking like the United States had any input. What could possibly go wrong? They all get put at Miami Zoo for training. The so, so connotations aren't great, are they? It takes so long to train them that the invasion isn't ready till Eisenhower has left office. Under Jack Kennedy's administration in April 1961, these Cubans are land on the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. It was staged to look like a Cuban planned uprising, but Castro had it crushed within hours. This is the famous Bay of Pigs nonsense, and it's all been done very like clandestinely so that you won't know that America had any input, although surely if you were Cuban, you'd notice what direction they were coming from and that they were carrying American weapons. So instead of bringing Castro down, it actually raises him up. But the debacle of the Bay of Pigs doesn't end on the shoreline. You'd have thought the Americans would have stopped there, but actually there's more, a lot more. For starters, a lawyer is sent over to Cuba to try and negotiate uh, the release of all the Bay of Pigs captives. And the CIA decide to give this lawyer uh, a present to give Castro, uh, which is a nice wetsuit. If you were Castro, you'd be like, these people try and kill me every week. Why am I going to take a present from them? 
frankly, it looks a bit bizarre sending a lawyer over with a wetsuit. And Castro is right to be suspicious because that wetsuit is impregnated with bacteria and all sorts of deadly spores. If my worst enemy in the whole world turned up and said, here, have a present, I'd be like, yeah, what's wrong with it? So that one doesn't work either because he doesn't accept the wetsuit. He says, oh, I've, I've already got one, but thanks. But the Americans don't give up. Knowing that Castro liked to dive, the CIA planned to kill him using an explosive device planted in a conch shell at his favorite dive site. They get hundreds of conch shells and they paint them, you know, really gaudy, attractive colors to make them look, you know, very, very uh, desirable for any diver like Castro. But, you know, there's always something. They just couldn't find an attractive shell that was big enough to hold a quantity of explosive to get the job done. Surely anyone would be suspicious of a shell the size of a small car, which is what it would take in terms of explosive to actually work. So, no, that's just another dumb one that doesn't happen. Going back to the drawing board, the CIA comes up with its most infamous attempt to kill El Comandante. As well as his big beard, of course, Castro is famous for something else, and that's his big cigar. And since he never seemed to be without one, it would only make sense to use that as a means of assassinating him. Coming up... If you're Castro and you're Cuban, where you manufacture all the best cigars, why would you accept a present of cigars from your worst enemy? He manages to get three men with the bazooka in the building opposite the presidential window. All I have to do is fire that bang at Castro. He's gone forever. She holds the pistol on him for a moment and then lowers it saying, I can't Fidel. She's basically the worst assassin in the history of the world. The CIA is said to have made all kinds of attempts to take out Fidel Castro. Their most infamous effort was to tamper with his cigars. So they planned to either lace a cigar with a poison or place an explosive in it. But once again, plots to assassinate Fidel Castro were doomed to failure. If you're Castro and you're Cuban, where you manufacture all the best cigars, why would you accept a present of cigars from your worst enemy? So if he's not gonna accept your cigars, which he blatantly wouldn't, then you need to find a way to tamper with his, which didn't happen either. One reason for this is that Fidel has extremely good bodyguards. Castro's secret agents are just as keen to keep El Comandante alive as the Americans are to kill him. And you've got one man who's absolutely instrumental in keeping his boss alive and well, and that's a man called Escalante. And as he foils more and more of these assassination attempts, Castro promotes him, and eventually he becomes head of the Cuban Secret Service. Escalante's biggest nemesis is a determined Cuban exile called Antonio Bessiana, who has offered his services to the CIA and is desperate to try and kill Fidel Castro, who he thinks is a tyrant and, and needs to be gone. One of Vesiana's best opportunities is when he manages to get three men with a bazooka, you know, an anti-tank weapon, you know, in the building opposite the presidential window. All I have to do is fire that bang at Castro. He's gone forever. They're all set to try and, and shoot Castro with a bazooka till they realise that you can't position it to aim properly without it sticking out of the window. The guys doing it say, well, we can't take the bazooka out and put it out into the window because otherwise it'll be seen and then we'll be spotted and that'll be the end of it. I'm a rank amateur when it comes to killing people. I have no experience of killing people whatsoever and I'm pretty sure given five minutes I could come up with something that's better than this. It's said that the CIA was so hell-bent on taking out Castro that they were allegedly prepared to go to any lengths to get him. So the CIA decided to get creative. Um, before Castro came along, Havana was run by the mob. The Mafia. And the CIA are willing to do any deal with anybody to get rid of Castro. I mean, talk about doing a deal with the devil. Obviously, the American government doesn't want to be implicated in trying to kill Castro. Reportedly, they have an ex-FBI man as a go-between between the CIA and the mob called Robert Mayhew. It's Mahu who approaches the famous mobster Johnny Rosselli 
and says to him, Johnny, I represent some very powerful businessmen, some international corporations, and we want to give you $150,000 if you can rub out Castro. Will you do it? So the CIA are hoping that rather than come up with all these clandestine methods to try and kill Fidel Castro, that the mob will just walk up and shoot him in the face. But not even the Mafia want to do that. It's just too risky. They think much better option, poison. They attempt to poison Castro twice, once using his cook and once through his personal secretary, Juan Orta. Both fail and Orta is forced to seek refuge in the Mexican embassy for five years. El Comandante doesn't die again, so the mob aren't any good at it either. But Mayhew and Roselli aren't done yet. They think this poison idea still has legs. Odorless and tasteless capsules containing deadly botulinum could be dropped into Castro's drink. And the CIA has found the perfect patsy for them. Marita Lawrence was a German former lover of Castro who had recently fallen out of favor and as a result became bitter. She's a scorned woman. She's not very happy about being dumped. So the CIA approach her um, with these pills and say, get rid of him. And she says, OK. So she stashes the, the pills in a jar of cold cream and she still has a key to his apartment, so she lets herself in. Marita goes into the apartment. She unscrews the lid, opens up the cream and looks inside and the pills have disintegrated. They've basically dissolved into the cold cream. Because they've come into contact with something wet. The thing is now already a total failure, but it gets worse. Castro walks into the bedroom and lies on the bed. And then he realises that this ex of his is in his room, and obviously that's a flag because you've dumped her, she's not happy, and she's in your bedroom. He asks her straight out, have you come to kill me? And Marita, you know, doesn't know what to say. And Castro just takes out his pistol and says, go on then, kill me. Passes her the pistol. And she's holding it with these sort of trembling hands, and she just can't pull the trigger. She's basically the worst assassin in the history of the world. And he says, well, go on then, do it. She holds the pistol on him for a moment and then lowers it, saying, I can't, Fidel. And he grabs it and says, of course you can't. No one can. Fidel Castro outlived most of his girlfriends, US presidents and gunmen until his death in 2016. After all of the attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro, after they all failed, I can't help but reflect on the fact that a lot of money was spent trying to end his life sooner than it ended under natural circumstances. And the fact that he lived to old age, that was all money down the drain. But also, the fact there were so many makes the whole thing seem farcical. Uh, you know, and you've got these stupid methods of making beards fall out, of wetsuits with deadly spores. Uh, you know, you, you name it, the whole thing just reads like something out of a comic book. It is like a Wile E. Coyote cartoon, isn't it? I can't help but think that had they not given the contract to Elmer Fudd, they may have got rid of Castro more effectively. Maybe their heart just wasn't in it. You have to think that if their heart was in it, they would have actually pulled it off. Oh, that's cool.